Let's please give a warm sick hug. Welcome to Bill Down. Thank you, thank you. And I, I very much welcome the opportunity to be here. I, I had forgotten about my stint as an interim town administrator. Um, I, I learned my lesson uh, in, uh, in, in trying to be a, 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 a good citizen and, and helping out, but when the town of Silverton ended up not being able to hire the administrator they thought they were going to hire, and they were going into budget season, I was coming back from vacation and turned to my wife and said, well, you know, I was a budget director in the state of Ohio. Why don't I go volunteer my time to, uh, to help with putting the budget together? And two days later, I was the interim town administrator. <laughs> and I don't think I've ever enjoyed a job more. So I, I envy all of you the, the experiences that you're, you're having at the local level. Um, I, and, and I want to thank Mike for inviting me to come and share some thoughts on regional cooperation. Uh, and also to thank SACOG for all the support it's provided over the years. Uh, as late as last year, I was out here. Uh, I was on my way to the Bay Area to uh, speak at the annual conference at Joint Venture Silicon Valley, which you probably have some familiarity with, a public-private partnership. And as soon as I finished there, I came down with the worst case of the flu I've ever had. But I don't think it had anything to do with the topic that I was discussing in the Bay Area, which had to do with how do you strengthen the governance um, of the Bay Area. Um, and I didn't have to spend a lot of time thinking about Mike's invitation. Uh, I, it's always a pleasure to visit with one of the best, and, and you truly are. Uh, your accomplishments are, are, are really quite significant with the blueprint, which was discussed this morning, uh, the urban uh, rural connection strategy, and now the Innovation Task Force. So I'm very pleased to be able to share some thoughts with that. Um, Mike has asked me to sort of share thoughts about the future regions. He mentioned transportation, land use, shared services, regional governance. And I'm pleased to do that. However, I shared with Mike that I've really been spending most of the last couple of years uh, focusing on my time not on particular regional challenges, uh, but on building the capacity of regions to address the existing challenges as well as the even more demanding ones that are emerging. And I'm working on a new book on the future of regional cooperation, or as I'm increasingly calling it, regional governance. I'm tentatively calling it regional charter, a regional grand bargain, and I'll come back to that later. Uh, but before sharing some suggestions for innovations for your consideration, I'd like to share a bit of background on the reasons for my passion, and maybe myopia about regional governance as opposed to particular challenges. I don't expect you to agree with my analysis. In fact, I hope you don't. Uh, and maybe you can talk me out of writing the book. But even if I'm only partially right, our lives could change dramatically in regions that will be increasingly seen as the leaders for making this country the best place to raise a family and grow a business. And, and let me anticipate a concern, which is just more than reinforced this morning. Uh, you might be appropriately asking, why am I sharing these thoughts in the Sacramento region? Uh, you already have one of the best regional governance, what I call connectors. Those are the organizations that do the plans and deliver the services uh, in the region here in SACOM. Uh, and you're blessed with a much stronger consensus on these topics than a lot of regions around the country. Uh, in part because you're only in one state, or primarily in one state. And you don't have to go through the process that a lot of your fellow region, regional organizations have to do to get look-alike approvals in different states, or look-alike legislation, or look-alike authority to, uh, to move ahead. It's interesting to me that half the people in this country live in multi-state regions or in regions that share borders uh, with our neighbors to the north um, and the south. Uh, and you also very much um, have a willingness to discuss the tough topics. And I think that was evidenced in the discussion that you had on cap and trade and, and the implications it has around global warming and everything else this morning. But I still think SACOG and the Sacramento region uh, need to strengthen their regional governance capacity for reasons I will share and become a leader uh, in creating the capacity to address the toughest challenges and make this region envied at home and respected abroad. Uh, now I promise to share some thoughts uh, later for, uh, for some innovations. I'm calling some of them brave. 
I'll, I'll say they're the low-hanging fruit. Uh, they're the ones that will still take courage and consider. And then I'm sharing others which I'm calling bodacious. <laughs> Those are the ones that are both bold and audacious. And I'll take a bit of a quantum leap uh, beyond the, the topics that are currently on the agenda of the task force. But I think all the ideas I'm sharing are being implemented somewhere in a region across this country. And so none are too radical to be done. But I encourage you to listen, figure out what you can use. Uh, uh, but believe, I think over time, you'll have to consider a lot of what I'm suggesting is brave and even bodacious if you're going to thrive and prosper in the future. So my reasons, uh, as it was pointed out, I've labored in the trenches of uh, regional cooperation, actually for four decades now. Uh, I've worked with you and your colleagues on a variety of issues. Uh, that run the gamut from transportation to air and water quality to now emergency preparedness, global warming, always economic development, if not directly, somewhere in the background, and maybe the most demanding challenge of shaping cooperative, sustainable, equitable uh, growth. And I have fond memories. But I'm increasingly fine as I travel around that regional leaders and citizens are struggling to address the tough challenges. Uh, what took me to joint venture Silicon Valley last year uh, was a frustration that they are continuing to have that they can they can put the tough topics on the table and they have conversations around them. They can even develop some strategies and print reports about what ought to be done and then also often watch those reports just gather dust on the shelf or I guess they don't even gather dust on the shelves anymore. They just get deleted uh, <laughs> from, from, the, uh, from, the, from the computer. Uh, in, in large part because they really don't know where to turn to take the next steps. And they also frequently have this frustration of, uh, uh, instead of getting uh, some sort of traction on the issue they're working on, they shift to another issue and do go through the same sort of, of exercise. But I'm hearing it not only there, but I'm hearing it from conversations I have around the country. <coughs> and it's creating, I think, growing doubts about whether we're able to sustain momentum in pursuing regional challenges. Um, it's becoming more difficult, uh, what I'm hearing, to put topics on the table, uh, especially if they're very controversial. It's becoming more difficult to find someone who has the time and resources to actually address the challenges. Uh, it's becoming more difficult to secure approval from you and your colleagues, but from the larger community increasingly. It's not just local governments. You've got to get the other sectors involved. You've got to get citizens often to endorse what you're talking about. Uh, it's difficult to hold everyone accountable. Uh, all too often they say regional cooperation still means to say you don't have to say you're sorry if you fail. Uh, but on the other hand, you, don't, you can't expect to get any accolades if you actually succeed in addressing uh, a challenge. Uh, and I think the real concern is that I hear from folks, it often takes so long to actually get into addressing a challenge that the opportunities that seem to be lurking out there disappear and the, and, the, uh, and, the, and, the, and the threat that we, uh, you saw associated with it can often explode um, into, into crises. Uh, and these are hard words and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm picking this up more from my travels around the country than I am here because you are evidencing willingness as you did this morning to take on conversations about tough topics. I hear about a lot about limping into the teens, 2010s. You know, after suffering the Great Recession of the aughts, uh, the 2000s, uh, and doubting whether we can address current, much less the next round of challenges. I, I think we have a history, a can-do history, of going after these challenges. As one COG director refers to it, uh, we, we have a lot of experience in playing pickup regional cooperation. Uh, we get the people together who are willing to uh, participate. We, we turn to the tools that we might have laying around. Uh, we often don't have other than ambiguous rules about how to proceed, but we've been willing to take on uh, those challenges and muddle through until hopefully state and federal government step in and say, okay, we'll help establish uh, the rules for playing the game. We'll provide some resources to get you through a design of a, of a plan, and we'll maybe, if you're lucky, provide some resources to actually help you, help you implement things. Um, and then put you in a nice position of saying, well, we did it because the state and federal governments required us uh, to do it and required to do it in this way. Now I'm hearing a lot about regional leaders and citizens losing their nerve 
being reluctant to take the risk on tough challenges. There no longer seems to be the confidence that the state and feds are going to step in uh, and help us out in dealing with these challenges. Uh, or even sometimes to keep providing predictable support for the challenges we already thought we had wrestled with, like transportation or emergency preparedness or whatever else. Uh, the states and feds are struggling with their own governance challenges. Polarized politics, in most of the country, underfunded budgets and hovering on the edge of bankruptcy uh, due to threats like growing pension liabilities and a lot of other things. I hear most of the concerns <coughs> expressed in private conversation, but I think they're going to start to get public, and when they do, I think they're going to change the lives of you and your fellow regional citizens. Now, I've been traveling for the last few years overseas, and I think I'm discovering two things that are quite important. One, the rest of the world is catching up with us. Uh, and I think that was confirmed recently in a 35-year-old annual survey of income data worldwide by something called the Luxembourg Income Study Tax Data Tax Base. And if you're like me, you already suspected that the U.S. has the greatest income disparities. The study confirms that our rich are richer than their counter our counterparts in industrialized nations around the world and pay lower taxes. Are poor or poor, in large part because they have to work for lower incomes and they have a weaker safety net to, to help them out when they're in trouble. But the thing that shocked me the most was that in spite of being the world's richest country, we no longer have the richest or the middle class with the highest average income. Uh, Canada passed us this year, uh, Britain, the Netherlands, and Sweden are due to pass us in the next couple of years. And the reason for that is their incomes have been growing since 2000 and our incomes have not been growing uh, of the middle class since 2000. Um, and right now, we're still the richest country in the world, uh, but there's also a couple of reports now suggesting China will become the richest uh, country in the world over the next couple of years. We're experiencing slower growth in educational attainment, uh, and sadly, fewer opportunities for new generations, uh, those not born to wealth and connections to succeed, which was cited in another recent survey. It appears, I think, in some ways, that we're finally becoming a middle-aged or, uh, or even older country. We no longer can necessarily afford the excesses of youth uh, or uh, depend on time to heal our mistakes. And I, I think that was brought home to me in the discussion over Obamacare. Uh, I think that's only the opening salvo. In a, in a conversation and a fight we're probably going to have hell in health care as long as we continue to become an aging country for the coming years and decades. Uh, so uh, tough and hard words, I believe, and as I said, not necessarily as, as applicable here as in some of the other regions that I'm working in, uh, but we run the risk, I think, of just becoming another aging industrialized nation and not necessarily the model to be followed in the rest of the world. Uh, now, what does this have to do with regions and you as leaders? Uh, I don't believe we can change this situation unless our regions, which drive our economy, are seen as the best places in the world to raise a family or grow a business. Regions are large enough to offer all the ingredients that you need to be competitive in the global farmer mar farmer's market. It offers the, the entrepreneurs, the capital, the labor, all the things that are needed yet small enough to bring all the relevant actors, the stakeholders, together and implement tangible actions uh, that address the thorniest challenges, such as pursuing a new economic development opportunity, <coughs> constructing a critical piece of missing infrastructure, rooting out a discriminatory housing practice, <coughs> assisting a struggling jurisdiction, and maybe most importantly, shaping future growth that is competitive and sustainable, all of which are probably controversial actions in most regions today and all too often the kiss of death in the current political culture. Even if we need to take these actions to create the excitement that makes people want to come to our regions and be the place that they make their investments. Uh, here's the difference. Other industrialized nations and even developing countries understand this and are beginning to take action to make their regions desired home. Maybe, most importantly, their national and state provincial governments are investing uh, in building the governance capacity of those regions. Uh, they, like us, want to invest in, uh, in the, uh, building the capacity of, of what is local and closest to the people. Uh, 
Um, but they had started looking at the idea of where can we make those investments that have the most impact on the challenges that we're wrestling with. They referred to this as subsidiarity. Uh, subsidiarity. Uh, and that is who you are the most local. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't met our governor. Oh, he, 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 yeah, okay, he refers to that as well. But the whole idea is you want to invest in the local governments uh, in some ways that assemble the affected stakeholders and have adequate resources to address, to address the challenges. And they're increasingly concluding that the most local governments that can address these challenges are regional. Uh, maybe most importantly, they're also increasingly seeing that their regions are living organisms. They have vital organs, downtown, uh, business and cultural districts, suburban shopping malls, residential neighborhoods, recreational areas, all tied together by the seniors of transportation, the arteries of commerce, the protoplasm of the community. Uh, these living organisms never seem to be the right size. They're too big for addressing some challenges, too small for others. They confront all of us with a, a sort of Goldilocks paradox uh, that's never the right size for what we really want to do. Uh, but we've been dividing up these these living organisms for over half a century and creating, in some ways, a disaster. And we now need to sort of reconnect these <coughs> organisms in a way that they can be healthy and thrive in the global marketplace. As I said, I've been traveling the, the world for the last couple of years. I've been to a number of industrialized nations, Italy, Sweden, China, Canada, a lot of still developing ones, Thailand, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Chile, fascinating visits with government officials in Chile, Mexico, Ghana. Uh, in Canadian provinces, a lot of European communities are now creating multi-level regional uh, governance, where you have a regional level, a county level, and, uh, and a municipal level. You witness that in, in Montreal and Toronto. But many more countries and provinces are creating regional governments, or even making their regions their own provinces. China has done that, for example, in Shanghai uh, and in Beijing. There was a report put out a couple of years ago by the Metropolis Association, which looked at 72 regions worldwide, including uh, the 28 largest ones. And uh, what came out of that report was very interesting. Over half of the major regions worldwide now have regional governments. Some are states and provinces. More often, however, there are a variety of federal or administrative districts or prefecture governments or something along those lines. And then there's a couple of full service uh, regional planning and service districts, including the two we have in this country, uh, in Metro Portland and in Metro Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul, which interestingly enough, uh, no longer cover their entire regions. They're actually smaller than the real regions in both of them. Another six of the metropolises are the major regions or even capitals of their country, and they're basically run as federal districts and often have services delivered by their national Government. So almost two-thirds of the regions surveyed have something akin to regional governments. They all deal with the same ambiguous boundaries that we do here. Uh, they all have preserved local governments with sometimes more imagination and, uh, and interest than we even have in this country. Uh, they all deal with the same sort of challenges, political, environmental, whatever we have here. Uh, they all have still a lot of independent organizations doing planning and service delivery that are not part of the regional governments. Uh, but the most significant difference maybe is they're all empowered to plan, to implement, and to carry out regional uh, initiatives once there is agreement amongst their leadership that they need to address them. And most importantly, all are accountable to higher levels of government. And sometimes the citizens who direct their elected executives and the members of their governing bodies. Uh, this is even beginning to happen in China is having a virtual explosion in citizen protest, uh, many of which are against what's happening at the regional level. If regional groups are not working in other countries, the voters step in and change the leadership, or higher levels of government step in and tweak the organizations. The remaining one-third of the, of the region surveyed are like us. They have voluntary or sometimes mandated regional councils uh, of governments, uh, such as we have here in this region. Uh, the other thing that's very interesting is that national and provincial governments are plowing enormous amounts of money uh, into regional economic development. I think my best example is in the European community, uh, where they collect the value-added tax, which collects tens of billions of dollars each year, 
Almost all that money goes into regional economic development, and they do it in a way that would be very hard to copy in this country. It all goes into regions that have a lower, what they call, capita per head uh, than other regions. So if you're rich, you don't get anything. It goes into the poorer regions of the... So talk about investing and giving everyone above middle uh, class, above average middle class uh, income. Now, our vigilante pass makes, makes these sorts of approaches hard to accept, but we still need to build the capacity uh, if we are to compete. And unfortunately, sometimes our federal and state governments are not leading. Uh, the federal government's offering a few experiments right now in, in cooperation uh, with the, so, so, such as the HUD, DOT, EPA uh, collaborations. And a few states like California <coughs> are making forays. And I think we heard one of them today. I mean, in part, the conversation that was taking place this morning is really talking about regional governance and empowering regions to carry out a, a statewide initiative. Uh, so where does this leave regions and you, their government, somewhat alone? And this is, this is why I think uh, the, we need to sort of think about new approaches to maybe governance or tweaking existing approaches to governance in regions. Um, I'm suggesting regions need to draft their own charters uh, to provide the governance capacity, the tools, the trained citizens, the experts, the funding, the rules, and the powers to play the regional uh, cooperation game and be able to play championship regional cooperation. Uh, you're all familiar with charters. You have them in your jurisdictions, I'm sure. Uh, businesses have them, nonprofits have them. Uh, a regional charter would be a bit different. Uh, it wouldn't be for a single entity, but would be for more a, uh, an integrated governance network that included not just SACOG, but the other organizations in the region. So you would not have a single regional government to address regional challenges. We need to be drafted by some form of a charter commission, uh, need to secure public approval from the voters, need to implement some key components and be updated uh, on uh, maybe after each <clears throat> national uh, census. Uh, but I think uh, maybe most importantly, they could provide the basis for regions entering into uh, sort of grand bargains with state uh, and national government. If we as regions can say we've gotten our act together, we've got the capacity now and the tools that we need to take the lead in dealing with regional challenges, what can we bargain with, with state and national governments? Would it have to do with funding or more flexible funding? Would it have to do with more discretion to implement various regulations and those sorts of things? Uh, would it be have to do with having the authorities that we need to make life simpler for governance in regions? For example, not having to go to states uh, if we want to want to uh, test the interests of the public in supporting a referendum or a new funding approach or something like that. Something like that. Uh, so I'm not going to focus on the charter per, per se today. I really want to focus uh, on uh, some, some tangible ideas that you could do uh, through the Innovation Task Force. But I wanted to share this sort of introduction so you have a sense of where my thinking is leading me and then also to suggest to you what are sort of 10 components that would be in a, in a regional charter. So let me <clears throat> pass this around. <coughs> I'll go through this very quickly to let you, uh, let you come back on anything you think might sound interesting. Um, two disclaimers that I want to make. First, I'm not suggesting an all-powerful regional government. Let me repeat. I'm not <laughs> suggesting an all-powerful okay, regional government. Thank you. Uh, but, but I believe there will be more pressure of an ad hoc nature coming along uh, from higher levels of government if regions don't take initiative to put their own sort of acts together. Uh, I, was, I was active at the National Association of Regional Council when the Atlanta region did not put its act together, did not come up with a transportation plan that satisfied citizen desires and met the requirements of state and federal government. So what does the state do? The state creates a new authority, Greta, Georgia Regional Transportation Authority, to take control over doing transportation uh, planning. Um, that hasn't been repeated since, but I think if pressure builds enough uh, in a particular state, something like that can follow. 
And a second, a limitation of my suggestions. Um, I know enough about this region to know I don't know enough to recommend anything to you. So the ideas I'm sharing could very well be ones you've already considered or ones that really don't fit. Uh, but let me throw them out anyway. Uh, so, so looking at the, the list before you, I'm only going to comment on some of them. But if, I, if we're going to, I think, make sense out of governance in regions, we need some sort of a vision uh, for governing the region. Uh, what do we want governance in the region to look like when we grow up? I call it a care vision, cooperating to achieve regional excellence vision, that would share the principles that would guide regional governance. And I understand uh, that the Innovation Task Force has been wrestling with the question of what should be the guiding principles for the selection of short and long-term transportation projects. And I think you've already entertained the notion that maybe that ought to be partially guided by the principles that are in the blueprint. Uh, compact. That's exactly what the Denver region is doing. Dr. Cog, which is the regional council there, is building the notion of their mile high compact and the principles in the mile high compact being part of what shapes the decisions on transportation projects. But the care vision could help as well uh, in terms of shaping, uh, shaping that vision. So uh, one, one idea is to start building a care vision incrementally. Maybe you want to establish a policy that would be a policy around governance uh, that you would want to begin to apply selectively. Maybe one thought that runs in my mind is joint service agreements, for example, uh, making sure they deal with equity issues when you're advising how to set them up. Because I think we often find that per capita cost sharing is not necessarily the fairest way to be delivering uh, joint uh, types of services. Uh, there's a number of current hot topics, and, and Mike asked me to suggest what's hot. A lot of places are looking at, at, uh, at broadband service as something that they might be able to do something cooperatively. And I notice you're also looking at joint utility pools. Uh, and a lot of regions have gotten into that sort of activity as well. Uh, if you pick a topic that's really huge, you can dramatically, however, change the organization. Uh, because what happens is the pools start driving the organizations unless you can sort of spin them off as separately uh, run run entities through, through a joint powers authority or something like that. Uh, and the bodacious initiative is to actually prepare a care vision. Second, uh, an abundance of practicing regional citizens. People are willing to be boundary crossers to pilgrims for, for achieving regional excellence. The people that you need to create the parades that you can then lead to address the really controversial challenges. And I call these places regional citizenships, sort of like a regional cheers place where you can go and get some training, uh, you can get some support to get involved in regional initiatives. Maybe even if things get bad, you can get a little bit of R&R &R and, uh, and get supported for the, for the things you've taken on. And there's, you can offer some sort of a regional governance 101 to citizens. There are programs like this around the country, regional connections in the Louisville region. Uh, one I really enjoy, which is the Greater Philadelphia High School Partnership. And maybe you heard about this in Philadelphia. But seniors in the high schools come together across the region to work on common projects. They work on common regional issues during the course of the year. Uh, train regional leadership program participants to be practicing regional citizens. Uh, individuals who graduate from leadership programs should be prepared to work on these sorts of issues. Uh, the bodacious initiatives create some sort of a regional citizenship. Uh, the regional cheers I was talking about. Maybe it's a joint effort between uh, SACOG and, and, uh, and Valley Vision to, to really get more people in the place where they have comfortably been practicing regional citizens. Uh, the next item, a, a regional governing body. I won't bring that up at this point in time, the all-sector committee of the region. Uh, uh, having at least one full service turn to a regional connector, the fourth one. Uh, there needs to be at least one place where anybody in the region can go and raise a regional issue. Uh, and they're not necessarily going to get a lot of assistance, uh, but they know that someone is there who will chat with them, who maybe will give them some background information, give them a few leads. Uh, if that's uh, SACOG, and that's what I suggest it should be, uh, you don't have to pursue it any further. You'll have to make your own decisions about something you want to get into and want to deal with further. Uh, but I think it's important to have one place where uh, you can uh, have a turn to connector, and that's my brave initiative. It's, I think it's very good that David Warren is coming out next month because Mark, the Mid-America Mid Regional Council, 
has pretty much announced that it is a turn to organization, and anybody can go to Mark to get some form of assistance in dealing with regional challenges. Um, and the Bodacious Initiative is make SACOG a full service regional connector uh, that either has the capacity or can develop the capacity to address any regional challenge that the leadership decides uh, that it can take on. There are still uh, a number of regional organizations in the country who never get beyond step one, who have fights about whether we ought to be even addressing this issue or not, or whether we have the authority to address the issue. I think we need to create entities that have the authority, but don't necessarily have the authority to do anything they want to do. Uh, it could be very much like the situation with Metro in Portland, that if you want to take on a new issue, you go to the voters or you go to the governments and say, should we take it on? And if you get the authority to take it on, <clears throat> then you have the license to go out and generate the revenues and do the things that are necessary to take on that particular particular, particular challenge. I'll skip over the, the fifth one. <clears throat> Mention the sixth one of independent regional governance audits. Uh, some places are beginning to conduct post-mortems uh, on how well they ran particular regional governance challenges. How well did they actually carry them out? And they're especially focusing attention on the ones where they're un, unsuccessful. Um, the, uh, also, some places they're beginning to train citizen auditors or even create citizen juries that are trained to sort of look at how well did we do on a particular challenge and how well did we run the process for the challenge. That's the brave initiative. It's bodacious create a, a, a state of the region report. I always say bodacious because for a long time my favorite example was the state of the region report in the Los Angeles region that SCAG put together each year. Uh, for better or for worse, they decide not only to report on how they're doing, they decide to assign grades to the region. Uh, and that only tends to work well Note that for the Mark grades. Is retired. Yes. <laughs> That, that only tends to work well if the grades are going up. <laughs> but in LA, the grades were going down. And every year, there was this huge anticipation. And I mean, they had huge press conferences. Everybody would turn out. And then as soon as the grades came out, all they got questions on were the grades that went down. Uh, and an incredible amount of negative coverage. So guess what? The, uh, the state of the region report is not being produced anymore <laughs> in the region. So that's why that's a bodacious. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll skip over the regional funding one and a, a grand regional grand bargain, uh, but uh, uh, touch on something that you did ask me to touch on, testing the regional charter capacity by shaping cooperative, competitive, equitable regional, uh, regional growth. Uh, other places are doing things like, uh, and I think you do a bit of this as well, reviewing developments of regional impact. Uh, not with the power to stop them, but with the power to at least review them and suggest changes if they are having some sort of adverse regional impacts. Uh, there's some places that are now sharing revenues generated by developments of regional impact. That happens in the Hackensack Meadowlands in New Jersey, the Kennebunk Port area of uh, Maine. Uh, I think it would be interesting if we could find a way to reward uh, uh, local governments or who have developments of regional impact that share their benefits of those with, uh, in terms of jobs or tax sharing or whatever with their neighbors. Uh, and, uh, and maybe the, the reward for them is they end up getting higher rankings uh, when it comes to transportation projects. So if we could find a way to not only look at the developments of regional impact, we could find a way to share them. I do not believe we can have effective regional cooperation unless we have effective regional equity. Uh, if we can't deal with the equity question, there will always be a stumbling block to the question of uh, cooperation. The Bodacious Initiative creates something like the, the Metropolitan Policy Advisory Committee in Metro in Portland. Now, when you went to Portland, did, did you have an opportunity to, to visit with Metro or look at any of those? Uh, okay. The, the Metropolitan Policy Advisory Committee is made up entirely it's, basically this group here. It meets twice a month, the uh, second and fourth Wednesday of the month, five o'clock in the afternoon. And it makes all the decisions, so to speak, and I'll, I'll, I'll condition that. It makes all the decisions about how to allocate housing 
industrial residential development and makes a decision pretty much on changing the, the urban growth boundary. It has to have that signed off and approved by the elected metro board, but it makes all those recommendations. So if you want to get one taste of what the future of regional uh, cooperation could look like, go to one of those meetings. Um, I suggest the one, I think it's June 25th, uh, to go to that meeting, five in the afternoon. I always suggest that because you can stay around the next day and go to the Metro board meeting and get a taste of both how impact works and also about the Metro board meeting. Uh, there's a number of places now sharing revenues. I know that's a very difficult subject to talk about region-wide. Uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul region does it. The Dayton, uh, Dayton region does it. Uh, but I noticed this morning in the paper you're looking at another way to to, uh, to share revenues, and uh, I noticed that Sacramento County is talking about dedicating a part of the sales tax uh, for, for various cultural and other sorts of assets. I, 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 it's, there's, there, there is an interesting pattern that runs through all the regional asset districts. I, I that is, there's always there. We're not talking yeah. about sharing sales tax, we're talking about an additional sales tax. No, no, I understand. But the but other, there's a difference to me. But, yeah. but the other places are sharing. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's a common element in all of these, all of these, all of these, all of these regional asset districts, and that is there's always a stadium involved in the discussions. Uh, no, there's one in the, in the Pittsburgh area that focuses the regional asset district that focuses on a variety of things across the region. Similarly, in the, in the Denver region, and I'm not suggesting changing what you're doing here, but keep in the back of your minds this sort of notion: this could grow into a region asset district over time and other counties and other jurisdictions could become part of it. Uh, my only political suggestion on that is uh, if you have libraries in, it's a great asset. <laughs> the librarians in the Pittsburgh region <laughs> sold the asset district. I mean, they were the most aggressive and active lobbyists that existed in the entire region. So if it's not libraries, find somebody that will go out and stake their reputation on success. And last, celebrate uh, uh, the Communicate the regional story locally and globally. Some places now have annual uh, one region day. Uh, uh, in the Kansas City region, they have one KC day. In the, in the Hampton Roads region, they have something similar. But it makes sense to try having a one Sacramento day. Uh, recognize regional treasures. And you do a lot of that in the annual awards that you provide. Mm -hmm. I think the Chinese are the great model for this. They create what are called regional treasures. And you not only get recognition, but you get special treatment. Uh, once you have been designated a regional treasure. So I have one of these kids. Why? 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 No, and even you, you have to have sacrifice. You and you have to be very old. You have to be very old to be a treasure. Too. And I know you're looking at, because it's already a topic on your task force, looking at coordinating and and uh, the, your representation uh, at the state level and at the national level. A lot of places are trying to get away from stovepipe and all of that. And then over time, the more bodacious idea is, is to create national and global councils of regions. My, my model for this, again, is from the European community, the Committee of the Regions. They're actually written into the, uh, uh, into the Constitution for the European community. Uh, the Committee of the Region, which is made by folks like you, but one from each region, uh, actually uh, are empowered to review and, and make comment on any legislation before the European Parliament. They're allowed to actually challenge the decisions that are made by the executive in the, uh, in the, in the international court that the European uh, community has. They basically recommend how to allocate the value-added taxes uh, that are collected uh, collected there, and maybe most importantly to what I'm talking about, they have funding which they use to fund uh, experimentation in governance across, the, uh, across Europe. And they create actually institutes on their own, or they fund other institutes, and if a good idea comes along, they actually fund demonstrations of that particular idea uh, across the country. So, uh, in closing, uh, you're going to, I think, have to be brave and especially bodacious to make regions succeed. You don't need a charter, but I think you need to consider all ten of these components and then implement them uh, incrementally. And only then, I think, are we going to feel comfortable that there's a there there to address 
tough challenges. But I, as I mentioned earlier, I think there's an advantage in putting a charter together because I think it allows you to go to state and, and federal governments and say, we put our act together, now empower us and let us do the things we need to do uh, to, to succeed. Um, uh, and to paraphrase Garrison Keillor from, from Prairie Home Companion, uh, when our regions are governed effectively, the rich will be investing <laughs> in the toughest challenges, the poor will be working for living wages, uh, and the middle class will be way above average. <laughs> uh, thank you. So, so thank you. So I, I hope any comments and suggestions. And How can anybody questions. disagree with your closing <laughs> argument? <laughs> Good closing statement. Uh, uh, no, but I know it's a, it's a, uh, it's a tough subject, and uh, it took me a, a period of time to get into it and to get especially passionate about it, and I think. I think what began to change my opinion on the subject uh, was the, some of the information I shared in the beginning. Not only are we as, uh, as, as exceptional a place as we once thought we were, uh, the rest of the world is actually beginning to make investments uh, that make, to make their regions work. And I'm not saying they're making the right investments, but it's become a priority uh, of, of most of the industrialized nations, and increasingly more developed nations. Um, yeah, I was in Chile, and they were going through a discussion about uh, regionalizing, interestingly enough, education uh, programs, uh, as well as a lot of the, uh, the parks and recreation um, activities. And so there's this constant conversation going on about what's the most appropriate thing to be, to be done at, at different levels um, around the world. And I think in many ways, that, that conversation has, has dried up. Uh, a good deal in this country. Though, as was the case this morning, every time something new comes along, there are governance implications for the region, and you got to go through that conversation again to figure out how you're going to handle that particular topic uh, as a region. But let me stop. Thank you for taking over. Questions, comments, suggestions? Well, I don't want to speak for Colfax, but I suspect that both Lincoln and Colfax would be very open to a tax sharing agreement. <laughs> sure. As long as they get the bigger share. Uh, I, I can't help but ask this question because this is the one that drives me crazy the most about the uh, Agenda 21. This, this topic comes uh, to the loudest protest. It's going to be it was on our board of supervisors agenda or my city council's agenda in El Dorado County. They would have, uh, they'd be marching up and down the signs that this is nothing more than a, a European model for, uh, for regional, regional government. Mm -hmm. We're going to do away with the city council, we're going to do away with the, the county board of supervisors, everything's going to be controlled uh, outside of Sacramento. Yeah, but at Sacramento yeah. or the city club, which is, is there, as far as they're concerned, it's Sacramento. They don't understand the regional concept of this. Yeah. Uh, I know both Brian and I have dealt with this issue over the years, uh, and you know, I I always say, show me where we have regional control. Um, you know, they always come back to the housing element, or they come back to they don't like the transportation plan, or but it's they can't come up with. Can't show the um, quote the agenda. They can't show the conspiracy, if you were mm -hmm. conspiracy theory. Your answer to that? Well, I don't. Are you part of this? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, no, no, I'm not. I, I, I truly think. <laughs> I, I truly think that uh, uh, at, at at this time, anyway, uh, I I think. I think local governments can take control of this agenda. I think I think the option is there to do that, and that's why I suggest the approach of a charter. You know what? What I'm really talking about is is you're deciding to collectively give yourself the same ability to do things in the region that you can now do as individual local governments. And I'm not saying what the answer to that question is. I'm not saying maybe you have everything you need and you don't really need to strengthen anything else. That Level. But the whole the idea of the charter is really to, to encourage uh, local government 
governments more than anything else, to think through the question of what do we need as tools, what do we need as authorities, what do we need as powers, what do we need as, as agreements with the state and federal governments that are going to allow us to do the job of, of taking the lead on tough regional challenges so that we, with somewhat the same confidence, can say we can do a regional piece of work just as well as we can do a local piece of work. And that's where the idea of charters come from, because in many ways you operate under charters. And they are thought through in terms of what authorities and powers and abilities you need to have to deal with your challenges. Uh, and I think what saves charters, and that's the suggestion I build in here as well, is they have to be revised periodically. Uh, you have to re-examine the question of whether you've got the right set of, set of tools for doing something. So I'm suggesting a tool that you can take charge of and do. I, I, I have real fears like you do of, of what happens when a state government responds to a dilemma, or even to some degree now when the feds respond to a dilemma. Uh, it could very well be the, the same sort of knee-jerk reaction that took place in Georgia uh, in the Atlanta region. Uh, the state government had no idea what was the right thing to do to deal with that dilemma. So they, they went to the default position and we'll just create another authority that will give the power to do X without thinking about all the implications of adding someone else into that that volatile mix of, uh, of, uh, of regional actors was going to do nothing but stir the pot uh, and make life even more difficult. So I think it's not so much that, uh, that uh, uh, I'm not advocating what the form should be. I don't think it should be regional government. But I'm really saying take charge and, and, and decide for yourselves how you want to be governed as a region uh, and don't wait for ad hoc initiatives of the state or federal governments to to, to dictate that to you. Um, and I, you know, I, the, the, the strange thing is when I came, when I started my career in the 1960s, there wasn't a hotter topic. We had a very aggressive uh, local, state, national partnership. You remember the Advisory Council on Intergovernmental Relations? It did wonderful <coughs> studies of all sorts of different models for, uh, for governance uh, in metropolitan areas especially. And actually, some of the some of the demonstrations that came out of that actually actually resulted in some of the changes that we saw in this country. But it's like somehow the other at some point we decided we don't have to look at this subject anymore. It died. Funding disappeared. Nobody's taken up the, the cudgel since then, and I and I don't think anybody will. That's the, that's my bottom line. I think you've got to do it. And if you're lucky, maybe you can get the state of California to fund an examination of how the government of Sacramento region, or a foundation, or someone else, but I think, I think somehow or the other, uh, you, you've been left with the responsibility for, 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 for taking this, this issue on. Bill, how much of your um, charter concept is public sector entities, especially general purpose government cities and counties, versus private sector in the mix and civic sector plan. Is it, could you talk about that a little yeah. bit? Yeah, I, I think increasingly, you know, it's all of the above. Um, I mean, uh, even, for the, even for the work you're now doing in transportation or, or, uh, or other topics, uh, you have to get outside of the borders of, or outside of just the local governments alone. You have to get the chambers involved. And, sometimes have to get the other academic uh, interest involved. It's increasingly, I think, important to get the civic interest involved uh, and because there's very little you can suggest anymore. It isn't controversial. Uh, and, and in a controversial situation, the, the default position is usually no. Uh, you know, if I don't understand it, I'm going to vote against it. So it, it's important to get the public involved. I didn't talk about my one uh, the one notion that we don't find yet anywhere in this country, the only one of the ideas I shared that isn't somewhere in this country, and that was the idea of an all-sector committee of the region. Um, and the idea for that is, is if we've got to have a local governing body and we don't want to have a regional government, what do we really need to have somebody have the authority to do at the regional level? Um, and so I, uh, I suggested the notion of an all-sector committee of the region, how you select the members is something that would have to be debated about. Uh, you could probably have, as you do now, local governments could appoint 
some of the some of the folks to uh, to do that. Uh, you could uh, have other sectors have representatives on that group. Citizens is an interesting question. You might want to elect a couple of citizen representatives to this. But I'm talking about a group that has very targeted authority. And here's what I'm sort of thinking about in terms of that group. Uh, it explores all regional challenges brought to its attention, even the ones that some of its members do not want to explore. Uh, it proposes a process for addressing each regional challenge and anointing responsible regional connectors, like SIPNA, uh, including postponing exploring some challenges with region explanations. Uh, it monitors progress in addressing regional challenges, including reporting regularly to the public. It assists the regional connectors, like SACOG, to submit plans if it's necessary for addressing challenges to the public for approval and has the authority to do that including proposals for funding priority actions as necessary. Uh, and it has access, this is terribly critical, has access to predictable, even dedicated resources to carry out. So what I'm suggesting is if you have to have something akin to a regional government, limit it to only be making sure that issues get addressed and the resources are there to address them and somebody's being held accountable. Don't create an authority that also does all the planning, does the service delivery, have that done by by other sort of folks. So the idea of a, of a fairly narrowly focused group. Uh, and, and the reason I, I thought about that one is where do we run into a stumbling block in governance in terms of dealing with challenges and what do we need to have in place to guarantee that this happen? The, the impact group I talked about work in, works in the Portland region primarily because if they don't deal with the issues at the level of the local official, uh, the Metro Board can step in and say, thou shalt. You know, there's some accountability somewhere in the region to make sure the issues are addressed with untimely sort of that. I know this, none of this sounds good. I, mean, I know it all sounds very distasteful. But, the, uh, but, but somehow or the other, uh, if you're going to make, if you're going to tell state and federal governments we can do anything that we set our minds to do, you're going to have to be able to prove you can do anything that you say. Set your mind. Well, that's, that's a question. In setting aside the Agenda 21 and the black helicopter folks, uh, uh, what maybe it's a question to you, Mark? Well, it seems like we have that structure or most of the ability to the characteristics of what was just explained in our current structure. What is it that we're missing, or what would that bring that we don't have? I guess. Well, I will. I will say. Let's, let me try the image that's going through in, in my mind right now. First of all, I agree we have a lot of the networking and the connection fabric that I hear Bill talking about. Um, but I also see that we're, and I'm, I'm not saying, when I say we, I'm not saying SACOG per se, I'm saying we the re a much more generic regional we, that there are many opportunities for added value to the people of the region through cooperative action that we're not happy. And I do think we spend a lot of time when a new issue comes from someone. Sometimes it comes to the SACOG board from one of our members or one of our key stakeholders who thinks we ought to be talking. You, you all ought to be waiting in on an issue of water. Uh, sometimes it, it's a metro chamber sort of an issue. Sometimes it's Valley Vision. Sometimes it's, it's somewhere else. And we spend a lot of time from the staff guy's shoes deliberating over boundary issues. You know, I have this, this Venn diagram in my head of all these different entities. And to me, it's not just, first of all, it's not just general purpose local governments. It's the special districts and the schools and all the various JPAs that the local governments have formed. But it's also the private sector and all these other things. And we have a lot of those so if, if all those entities are like a bubble on a Venn diagram, there's a lot of those that overlap. So that when you, when an issue comes up, 
we have to spend a lot of time around the question, well, who's, whose role is this? Whose job is this? And a lot of times there's a, um, a, a very precautionary overlay to that. Like the, like the presumption is, unless there's a really strong, compelling argument that something different should be done, this, the status quo is presumed to be the best, the best, the safest place to stay. And so I do think maybe this is utopian, and we, you know, this is just not how the world works. But if we had a regional conversation that was clearer on a more holistic basis about those kind of things, that it, we would be much quicker to act, and it would be much clearer who the accountable parties are once the policy discussion is had to go and do. You know, you would never run a business that way. Well, I was going to say, and I was saying, I'm primarily a business owner. Right. right. That's, That's why you said happen that. happen to be sitting <laughs> as a, you know, as a <laughs> small city in this big picture. Right. But, um, you know, so from a private sector standpoint and from a local government standpoint, I mean, we've got plenty of layers of government we have to deal with, from the federal to the states to county, uh, and so just my initial reaction is, why would we layer on one more body that we have to answer to that could regulate me? And I'm spend, I spend, in fact, we're unproductive most of the time, we being cities and private sector businesses, we're unproductive, we're half the time just playing defense all the time, right? So why, I'm, I'm trying to find a compelling reason, other than getting outside the fact that, you help, I, heard, I heard the point about getting Cause and, and, and you know, you know, for, for funding, I guess, you know, more so. Uh, and we do that now, but I'm still struggling with it. I'm not opposed to this well, or I'm not, just, right. I'm not yeah. hearing yeah. a compelling reason. I think the business answer may be some instances, not all instances, economies of scale. There are instances, and I had a conversation where with uh, the Southern California COGS, there's a lot of smaller COGS that are not RTPA, so they don't have the transportation responsibilities. But uh, what they've done and what their conversations are, are how can we pool our resources so that we deliver, it's, it's a shared services concept, deliver services more affordably for us. And, and the biggest example that's come out of that group is the Western Riverside Council of Governments uh, PACE program, the, the uh, energy assessments. State law authorized um, each city to do one and do a program individually, city by city. Western Riverside Cog said, why don't we do that on a region-wide basis? And they actually invested some money to make it work so that they could do one program and in their first year, they've written a billion dollars worth of residential loans in their in Western Riverside County through working cooperatively, and together they've done that. And so that's yeah. maybe I, one. I reason. get that part, but I still yeah. haven't heard the issue that I, I, my, my fear of regulation. And there, and I'm pretty fearful of it, frankly. But there are plenty, plenty of others that are far more fearful and crazy about it. But I mean. Uh, but if you, I still haven't heard, you know, it seems to me you've got one more government, government body that has more control over a larger region that could wave their magic wand and, and, and tell me in Rockland I can't build something. But if you're part of the charter, you have a control over whether that regulatory entity. Well, one vote. I think it's very interesting because you see, if I, if you I see exactly vote. what he's talking about is I think people in general will only accept so much government. And as this regional concept grows, what happens to the state level? Well, now we got the state of Jefferson, or the six state breaks, or whatever the case may be, or we got the Republic of Texas succeeding from the Union. And even in the European Union, that thing is cracking apart. I think it's a matter of people are only going to take so much governance, period. And the fear is exactly the, what Scott's telling us is. To have a strong regional influence, all of a sudden they're looking at that's another level of governance. If that's going to happen, something above it's got to go. And that's my opinion as well. It's, Look, I, I think, <laughs> if, I, if I might add, sure, one thing might, might help your, your response. Um, <laughs> I, 
<laughs> Where it hurt. Uh, number one, one of the biggest things that go along with my concern in this whole thing is we haven't once talked about accountability for the individual voter at the regional level. We just started to almost get to it there, but not quite. I'm small rural. I haven't heard you say anything except there's some inequities, but I haven't heard you say anything about small, small rural representation, and I'm thinking 20,000 or less. So here I am, a voted, elect, uh, uh, a voted person uh, on a council, uh, theoretically representing the region, but as was stated, only one vote. My constituents look at who do we blame for what's being decided down here? Do we blame the one person that goes down once a month? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we throw that person out, but actually they're so disconnected from what's happening here, they don't really care. But they do care that somebody is out there, this agency they're not familiar with, a small rural community, and, and they're worried about where they're voting. How can they vote to affect this? They can't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in your next book, you might just throw a paragraph or two in there with some insight, because there's a lot of us. We're all small, but collectively, there's a lot of small rural. I, I Look, I haven't, I haven't finished this book. So That's what I was hoping for. <laughs> no, look, I, quite honestly, uh, um, you, you, you've been thrown a, uh, an unfair situation. I mean, that's, that's the reality of what we have in this country at this point in time. We, we could depend for a long time with, uh, with the sort of ambiguity of, of, of regions by having state or federal governments just pass legislation and say, this is the way you're going to do it. You're going to do this plan, you're going to go through this process, whatever. And we could influence it one way or the other. Um, but we never have, as a country, adequately dealt with the fact that uh, we've, we've had a level of governance emerge over the, the last half century that has become the driving force in the global economy. Uh, the regions drive our economy. That's, that's the bottom line. And if a nation has powerful regions, it has a powerful, a powerful economy. Regions have to work. Uh, and we are not set up to govern regions. We are set up at the federal, state, and local level. And increasingly, the challenges we wrestle with emerge not only at the regional level, but the multi-state, the neighborhood, and the global level. And we're not set up to deal with issues at those levels. Uh, and so the places that have gone to regional governments, quite honestly, have thrown in the towel. They've said, we've got to be more effective at the regional level. We don't know another alternative for doing that. They never had organizations as effective as SACOG to say, okay, I think we can, we, can, we can sort of live up to this new level of responsibility. They basically had pretty much, um, uh, pretty much hierarchical, hierarchical relationship between local governments and states. And, and so when it came to regions, they didn't have anything to turn to. And the default position was, we've got to be effective at the regional level, especially, you know, like here in, in, in Europe, they cut across national boundaries. And often those national boundaries are like Germany and Poland, who basically killed each other for a period of time. So Some of the borders are changing too, as we speak. <laughs> right. But, you know, yeah, which changed. Still, and this is really regionalizing. Really seems to be Russia. Yeah. <laughs> well, we yeah, but, but, the, but, but the thing is, I, I'm not. I'm not suggesting. I'm not suggesting an answer for you. There's not an easy answer. But I think we've paid a pretty serious price for not having this topic on our agendas for a long time. And I think what's happened, I, I think you're absolutely right. Regional council of governments have become the de facto, de facto regional government. I don't hate to use it in those sort of terms. So when we were frustrated and we couldn't make it happen, we sort of figured out how to tweak these organizations to make it happen. And it might very well be, you go through an analysis and you say, Say, Kyle gets the answer. We, it's not broken. We, we don't need to fix anything. But I think I think we could very easily pay a heavy price if we don't look at the question. If we don't look at whether there are some better ways for for uh, for doing what we are currently doing. There's there's a piece of this, a big piece of this, that quickly gets lost in these kinds of conversations, in my opinion. Uh, 
you know, the way you've referred to it, Bill, is if a region uh, has its act together, it increases the argument to the state or federal government that they ought to devolve responsibility. But in my mental model, it's a it's a much even more um, fundamental preset to enter the whole conversation, which is that there is a lot of money, regulatory authority, planning, responsibility that would be more effectively delivered if it was devolved down from the state level and the federal level to a more regional level. So it's a, it's an it's an anti-authority, anti-regulation from on high assumption. But I don't think for most issues that it's either politically realistic or practically realistic or even the right thing to do because the way the world works to think that, that, that very often that would get devolved clear down to the city and county level. I think it would, it would more likely get devolved to the cities and counties, the way I put it, is at their regional family table, both because in a practical world it's just a whole lot easier to think about that number of interrelationships. You know, it's, it's at least two orders of magnitude less number of entities to work with, but it's, but it, whether we like it or not, I think, I don't think anyone in this room would argue that there, there are just market and physical realities to, that that is the, or that is the fundamental organism. Uh, and so, it's a little, you know, I don't know, it's a little bothering to, to have that conversation be translated as more regulation and more top-down authority, when at least in my mind, it starts with the assumption of less regulation and less authority, but I don't think the local governments are, are playing their hands as smart as they could to insist that if it doesn't go clear down to the city and county level with complete autonomy there, that we're ever going to get that kind of evolution. I just don't, I don't see that you very often. You seem to be talking about two objectives. Like one is the objective to be able to secure funding from the bigger bodies, or is it to, you know, more closely regulate our region, have more control over the regulation, right? And I guess if they're like in Placer County, you know, we, the, the, um, our park, you know, we've, we've created this kind of a regional park concept, and essentially the feds have granted, you know, they've, they've advocated some of the regulation and kind of let us regulate ourselves much like a, you probably explain it better than I could, but uh, park, you know, park. So so that's that would be a, a, a laudable objective, right, to, to take away some of the overarching regulation and bring it down. Eliminate that part, the, again. Eliminate the state. But yeah, that's right. yeah, and, 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 and hold some of that away. But I'm still not, you know, not clear on is it, what's the objective, overall objective. Is it secure the money? Is it to regulate more locally? Or is it to, you know, devolve some or take away some of the... I, I think that I think the devolving is the reward uh, that, that, that uh, you negotiate with the states and the Fed. I think, I think the, real, uh, the real value of doing it is you strengthen your capacity as a group of local governments uh, to wrestle with the tough issues. That's, that's what you're really talking about. I mean, the fact of the matter is, I, I suspect that as, as, as local governments, we long ago learned, we don't have control over a lot anymore. Uh, most of the issues we're wrestling with don't fit within the borders of our jurisdictions anymore. Uh, we can pretend they do and usually pay a horrible price for trying to do it that way. Um, and we can actually work out sometimes informal arrangements with neighbors and that sort of thing about doing things, all which is good. Uh, but increasingly, if we're going to satisfy the needs of our, of, uh, you know, of our constituency, we've got to have the ability to cooperate with other local governments to make something happen. All I'm talking about is, is improving the capacity to deal with these common sorts of issues. Um, when I talk about the, the 
the devolution or the agreement with the, with the states and the Fed is pretty much taking advantage of if you put if you put the capacity in place to say we can now wrestle with any challenge that comes along. We need these authorities to be able to wrestle with it. Uh, and what we're asking the states and feds to do is say recognize that you now have a capacity at the regional level to do something uh, and start passing out funding that's more flexible, start devolving certain regulatory and other responsibilities to the... I, I don't... The reason I take this approach is I'm not looking at a new level of government as I am looking at a capacity for local governments to work together better. That regional cooperation economy and scale, some of the things we've talked about. Exactly. My little town doesn't have the opportunity to have somebody camping out next door, but we count upon SACOG to do that for us. Right? And, uh, and sometimes I think for us as a challenge, and I think it was brought up today, you heard it, is this an urbanized program because we represent a more rural area? You know, that's a conflict within SACOG itself that we have to talk openly about and saying, you know, this affects Sacramento this way, but it affects Colfax that way. And, uh, you know, you know it's, it's those things that we have to have the discussion on so the Sacramento people can at least realize, well, Colfax has got some things. You know what? I like going to Colfax. You know, and there's some, there's some entertainment value for me to go to Colfax. They got the winter dog races coming up. <laughs> well, you know, you know, the, you know I'm, I'm glad that I'm glad the, uh, the the comments are being made by smaller communities who feel like, um, uh, you know, it's hard to it's hard to be heard in the in the regional conversation. I I think one of the one of the things that putting together a a, a charter would do. But maybe put one of the elephants on the table that's very difficult otherwise to put on the table. And that is to make sure that we design processes and we design uh, ways of dealing with challenges that are equitable. Uh, and, and maybe make as part of the charter not only some principles but some guidelines for making sure when we wrestle with a challenge. We're going to go through processes and we're going to give consideration to, to equity as part of the as part of making decisions on particular issues. So right now, you if you're a small jurisdiction, uh, you're, you're you know you're trying you're trying to dance with the gorillas, uh, and uh, you can very easily get stepped on in those, in those sort of conversations. But if you if you had a charter that that sort of built into it, maybe built into it the notion that equity is a key part of what we're going to do, and here our guidelines are equity. At least you'd have something to wave at meetings um, and say, you know, well, we've got to proceed on this one in, in an equitable sort of way and talk about various options and processes and whatever. I don't, I don't, as I mentioned earlier in my comments, I don't think we're ever going to have effective regional cooperation unless we sort out the equity. So the equity so. question, you know, and, that, and that charter would help us maybe wrestle with that elephant directly. Uh, yeah. I'd love to throw some Sure. Um, to do it, right? yeah, it seems like we're going to we would be very well served to have a discussion about what what we would gain. And then I, just, I really hate to walk out of the middle of this, it, but it, you know, it, we have to go to the local government right across the street right, 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 right now. Right. It's a level of service issue. You, you can thank the clerk for pulling you out. Yeah, what do you think? It will be a file that there was something to that region. Our region would gain from Then the tool to achieve that is developed around it. And it isn't necessarily regional government. It's a regional initiative designed to get that particular objective. Mm -hmm. And so to throw something completely out, um, what if, our, if you took some of the things that are coming out of next economy, the need in, in our region for different kind of job training, that I, you know, if it's, whether it's construction jobs or what, whatever it is, job training that is not college or university training, or both of those things. If we were to partner 
as local governments with the education community to develop a, an advocacy plan, a funding plan, some commitments that we could make locally about how we would integrate the way we as a region deliver education and show some efficiency and in return get a higher level of state or federal funding to meet that initiative. Have you ever seen that kind of thing become the motivation? And does, does that sort of a suggestion change the dynamic of how you would do this? I mean, that's why I'm kind of trying to make it in particular. That's the missing piece for me on this. I mean, it's like whether it's business or anything, you, you one, you've got to chart out an, an objective, right? And uh, a purpose. And then an objective, and then a strategy, and and that hasn't been discussed. So just just to create a government, or just to open a business without absent e any of those, you're going to fail. I don't. I don't. Look, I no 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 form of government is necessarily going to guarantee success. I mean, no matter what we set up, we're going to deal with the same politics and the same. Can't achieve success unless you know what success is, is or how you. Define exactly. It. That's my point. Exactly, and part of and. and the reason, as I've thought through, what are what's a what, what's a small list of things you need to need to uh, have in place to be as effective at the regional level as you are at the local level, and that's what I was talking about in that all sector committee of the region. What if there was a guaranteed place where you could take that top, and within a given amount of time, you would get a reasoned analysis of that topic and a decision to move ahead, not to move ahead and designated who is going to be responsible for addressing it. I, I think, uh, and, I, and I'll go to other regions, uh, but um, I, I've, I've been down to the Bay Area about uh, once a year for the last decade, and they're still wrestling about whether they even should talk about a topic. <laughs> That's now, how, how, is that, how is that going to be a benefit to any of us? Uh, so I'm talking about a very limited set of a set of things that you empower a group to do, and maybe the most important one is agenda setting. You're empowering somebody to set the agenda for the region. Now, you're not going to like the decisions that come out of it. Sometimes it's going to be something you'd rather not have on the agenda or deal with. But you do know if you bring up a topic, it's going to be addressed. It's going to be considered, it's going to be examined, and a decision is going to be made about whether, whether to pursue that opportunity or not. That still doesn't guarantee you're going to said you're going to like what comes out of it and it isn't going to guarantee that group of people said we can't agree but at least that's a decision someone has said we can't agree about how to deal with that and it's off the table now and maybe there's an automatic uh, re uh, you know replacing it on the agenda after six months so it's forced to be done under consideration in the future um, but that's one of the things I when I travel around I find that uh, the real frustration is you can't even get the topic on the on the agenda. And I think where it's really beginning to hurt us, uh, and the reason I mentioned some of the other data, is that if a region doesn't look like it has its act together and can deal with the tough issues, then we're not going to attract the best people to, uh, to be in the region. Uh, and, uh, and if we are, as I think we are, becoming somewhat a more aging country, one of the difficulties of aging is ossification. I mean, we start we start thinking that the way we've always done it is the only way to do it and the best way to do it. So, What are you trying to attract those? Private sector, public sector? Because I mean, I think the free market has a lot to do with that if you're talking about economy. Yeah, I, 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 I have less a sense of, uh, of the, uh, the private sector role. I think there's actually, I think there's a lot of creative stuff going on in the private sector that doesn't need a regional entity to... Well, it needs probably less yeah, it regulation in order to flourish. Simulate. But what we often need the regional entity for is to make sure that the opportunities are there and the, and the resources and the infrastructure yeah. and whatever exactly. else is there. I mean, I was just, uh, <laughs> uh, Prince Charles, when I was in Pittsburgh, had a uh, conference that was hosted in Pittsburgh 25 years ago. So he decided to come back, and last year was the 25th year, uh, to follow up on it. Um, and, it was a very interesting conference in that light. But what I thoroughly enjoyed was the tours that they organized. And um, you go around and you find out there's all sorts of 
programs that are sort of joint public private to to uh, to provide the support and entrepreneur needs from the very beginning of having an idea through almost like boot camps that you can go to for three to six months to to explore that sort of idea and then go on from there to go to an incubator or something like that to really make the idea take off. Those are private sector initiatives. But what happens is, you know, it happens there, it happens everywhere. You need to have the public sector often supporting that, not necessarily with funding, but hey, do you have a building we can use for an incubator? Do you have something that, you know, and they're using a lot of old schools, for example, as incubators. Yeah. That's, where, that's where they go into those facilities. Um, I think we had 